So via telephone, we are joined by financial Phil McCoy, Ameriprise Financial and the Marius Group of Financial Advisors, along with John Everson there. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you? Sounds like you're in route someplace, Phil. I am. I'm on my... I'm on. You, I, we don't know what you said because that just <laughs> cut out. Uh-oh. Yeah, you're, that I Back heard. Yet. Don't cuss. <laughs> I heard the Don't cuss. <laughs> Dag gone. <laughs> Here, open material coming. Yep, Phil. Uh, let's start first with yep. football, right? Let's do it. All right, go ahead, let's man. Do it. Do you, it's Steelers Ravens yesterday. Give it to me. Well, that that was your traditional, typical Pittsburgh Steelers. When I couldn't be happier about how that game ended. We're going into the bye week, number one in the AFC North, and I have played terrible for the first five weeks. So a terrible Pittsburgh Steelers team is still the best in the AFC North as of right now. I couldn't be happy. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. It's always good to beat the Ravens. Now, I, have, I, I did. I was talking to Dylan, who happens to be a, a Ravens fan, and I don't, I've always wondered, how does that happen? How did anyone become a Ravens fan? You can say, well, I'm from Baltimore. Well, the Ravens aren't Baltimore. The Ravens are old Cleveland. So it's like Cleveland has two teams right now, and neither of them can be – but the, so Cleveland has two teams – he could have easily gone to Pittsburgh or, 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 God forbid, Washington or somewhere that was closer by instead of taking a transplant team. I said, look, man, nobody ever said you had to like your stepbrother. And that's kind of what the Ravens are to Baltimore people. They're not, they're not the Ravens. Those guys left in the 80s on the Mayflower to go to Indianapolis. That's their team. Dylan? And so I don't know how anyone, <laughs> He's not anyone done yet. ever <laughs> said – I, I, like I've, I've always wondered, like, what made you think? Oh, they're purple. I'll, I'll go. And their 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 mascot is a licensed infested bird. I think I'll go with this thing. I don't. I don't even get it. Infested bird. This this is regal. This is culture stuff. It's Edgar Allan Poe. Phil, come on now. I mean, I was born Edgar in nineteen. 19- Edgar Allan Poe, who was originally from South Carolina, I filmed that out last year. He's not even Baltimore. <laughs> Well, he died there, you know. It uh, counts for something. Uh, I was Talk born. About transplant. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe he moved in the middle of the night too, Phil. Who knows? Well, maybe. I was wondering why Dylan was avoiding me this morning. He seemed really quiet. <laughs> then I forgot he's a Ravens fan. I couldn't remember if he was a, a Commanders or a Ravens fan. So I was born you know, in nineteen. 19- I get all these messages from my fans or my friends about all oh, the drop passes and all oh, the interceptions. Well, those are called mistakes, and most teams that make the least mistakes win the game, and especially in big games, it's just too much for him, man, and it always has been for Lamar Jackson. It's a good day to be a Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> and now we've got a week off. We're going to figure that offense out. We're going to figure it out. No, let's we're get not. Some, let's get Travis Bajant and Ronnie Brown, and let's get those guys in there. Let's figure out that offense and, and get, on, get on our way to the AFC Championship. Let's go, do it. Go ahead, Dylan. You were about to say. I was going to say, I was born in 1998, so uh, the Ravens were already around. So I, I can't say that I was uh, <laughs> gone without a team at the very least. But I, I will say my mo- my mother, who is from Clear Spring, Maryland, actually grew up a Bears fan because of the 85 Bears. And for, so for a time, they were my favorite team. But it was very, when I was very little. So, But then I eventually came around to the Baltimore sports side of things, which – Boy, what an awful day for them yesterday, all the, all around. I went to the Orioles game yesterday. I wish I did. Yikes. Hey, so, uh, Phil, um, uh, A.R. Emmert wants to know, did you mean Tyson Bajan or Travis Bajan? Because you said Travis. Either one. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Travis could come block and Tyson could throw the ball. It doesn't matter. We'll take them both on the offensive side of the ball. And uh, Heather Compton, who's your, who's your team? Because Heather's not happy that you're talking Steelers right now. Blah, blah, blah is what she said. Same old Steelers, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Oh, gee, said Heather Compton. Uh, well, it is the same old Steelers because I think they've won six out of the last seven against the Ravens. So I guess it is kind of the same old Steelers. Oh, there it is. And now I Sorry, know why. Heather. She's a Ravens fan. That's <laughs> that, There's My the apologies. answer. Yeah. My apologies. I saved the seat on the bus. Heather, if you'd like a ride on the on the Steeler fan bus. <laughs> Listen, Lamar's only played like two of those last six out of seven. So I yeah. think he's. They said he was. He's played. Uh, this was his fourth game against the Steelers. Uh, yeah, what five years? Said, yeah, like, come on. Man. He's but been it, injured a lot. Did you notice the score between the two? 
uh, score dif differential between the two over the last uh, 15, yeah. 17 two years. Two points. Two points. Under two Harbaugh points. Tomlin, which yep. is the second longest coaching uh, matchup in the history of the NFL behind Lambeau and Hallis. Yep. Which is but pretty now it's insane. Plus nine. It's plus nine now. <laughs> <laughs> Philly, you're amazing. Uh, hey, uh, here's the thing. I was going through the things that happened on uh, this date in history, and I saved this one for you uh, for last because it was on this date, Phil, in 2007 that the Dow Jones, which I know you don't like to pay attention to that one, but it is the one most people reference, the Dow Jones Industrial Average this day, 2007, reaches an all-time high of 14,164 points before rapidly declining due to the 2007 2008 financial crisis and if you were wondering the uh dow futures right now at 33,433 16 years later so it's doubled in those uh 16 years plus another 5,000 phil uh remembering that crisis of 0708 and then what we've been going through lately uh the uh the market certainly has had its share of challenges this uh this century Yes, it has. And in particular, if you look at these last three years, just since COVID, there's been so many times where we thought, oh, boy, this is it. We're going down to all-time lows, and it's never going to stop. And it just hasn't panned out this way. And right now, we, we are in a very strange period. And I'd, I'd said, hey, there's a lot to unwrap with that jobs report that we got on Friday. And most people would, would assume that good news and, and in a vacuum it is good news. There's a lot of job openings. There's a lot of jobs to be had. The strange thing was, was we it was well over double what was expected, and our markets initially fell, I think, over a percent on the S and P or close to it, and then made a drastic turnaround. And I don't know the timing of these reports that came out of the jobs reports that came out, but the reason that we ended up in in a good position was because wages wages didn't increase. So. When you look at those two pieces of Friday's jobs report, one was how many job openings are there, which means that's a tight labor market. There's plenty to be had. And the JOLT report kind of told us that on Tuesday. So there's plenty of jobs to be had. What the fear, what the huge fear was apparently on Wall Street was that wages would increase. And that's the last piece of this inflation narrative that we have to bust through. And wages didn't. They, they fell short of expectations, which is – bad economic data, but it made our markets go up. Now, this week, I don't know that any of that will really lead into the CPI on Thursday, and there's a new little twist over the weekend with un unrest in the Middle East with, with Israel and, and Hamas. And the, uh, but, you know, neither one of those are oil producers, but it's in that – or huge oil producers, but it's in that region. So oil prices have gone up. But we have to remember that would probably impact the next CPI report and at the Federal Reserve, they've got those this, this two different CPI reports, one that strips out more volatile gas and food, and that's kind of the one the Federal Reserve is paying most attention to. So while in the short term the uh, price of oil going higher over the, over the weekend and into today may be a short-term headwind, but as far as inflation and what the Federal Reserve does to battle it, I don't know that it will have a huge impact because they tend to focus – more on the core CPI, which is without food and energy. Phil, I want to make note of uh, some of the points you've made of investing over the years, which is uh, to basically um, don't chase trends, don't chase individual stocks, uh, the, the steady approach. On September the 10th of 2001, the Dow was at 9605.51. From that day forward we've had 9-11 we've had the financial crisis of 2007 2008 there's been some recessions thrown in there as well the great recession uh we've had uh the covid outbreak right and we've had the recession we're going through now and the dow is still at 33,000 plus as we speak so all of that turmoil over the last 22 years and the dow still has gone from 9,600 to 33,000 plus. Yes. And, you know, at the end of the day, when you look at what drives these indices, it's the company's ability to make money. And when you when it boils down to it, the companies will find a way to make money. And we do have 
resolve in that that will happen regardless of what the economic environment looks like. And even going back to high school and college and you look at the economic cycle and the peaks and the troughs and what you had just mentioned was a bunch of troughs. And shortly thereafter, all of those events, our markets had really taken off. The dangerous part comes when we try to time those and we try to figure out when will those happen. And, and, you know, I reference March and April of 2020 quite often. But if I were to time that, and I do this for for a living, and and this is all really other than this and the Pittsburgh Steelers and occasionally volleyball (laughs) that that goes through my mind, but – the, I, if I would have tried to time that, I would have cost clients crazy amounts of money because I never would have thought that our markets would start recovery and continue all through 2020. So timing is the most dangerous thing that we can do, even though we know that, hey, look, we're at a peak. The next thing that happens is a trough, and we're at a trough. The next thing that happens is going to be a peak or expansion, then a peak. But if we try to time those, we're going to either miss out or be on the – or or buy in too soon. So the diversified approach and investing for yourself, it works out. Investing for your own situation and what you just referenced with the Dow uh, from 2000 until now kind of proves that. You know, with all that we've been through, our our markets, our our companies continue to profit. Bill, I noticed in your list of the three most important things going through your mind, your wife was not on that list. (laughs) She's number one. It goes unsaid. You don't have to say that. That just goes. That goes unsaid. You she should have said it, though, Bill. You should have said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like happy anniversary, <laughs> honey. It goes unsaid. <laughs> you said, 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 sound like you're trying to recover now, Phil. But, but you you made a mistake. Well, I think you're licking a gift well, horse in the I'm mouth there, Phil. <laughs> oh my God! And here it is, Columbus Day, and there's no kids in school, so she's likely listening. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Thanks. Now, hey, don't blame us, my friend. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm not blaming you, Bill. I'm blaming Rob. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all this talk of, of the markets, that is, the, it's really the, the the priorities and discussions of affluent people, folks who have enough spare scratch that they can go and they can put it into the markets and watch it rise or fall and, and have some savings to move into the future. But for so many folks, what matters is the ability to buy stuff right now. And it infuriates me. We see, you know, most people, they want to be employed, but the, the extra employment is a problem for the federal government, for, for the Fed in, in general. Imagine a world where the Fed just says, you know what, 3% is good. And we're, we're just, we're just gonna, we're gonna go for that, we're there. And how much better life would be for the rank and file people in America? Well, I'm, and, and we've talked about that before. I don't know, 3% may be a little high, and I'm in, I'm in agreement with you on that. Why don't we just say, hey, let's just get it down to here and not push for the 2%. Where I won't agree with that statement is that the markets are a place for that fluid. Because if you look at any blue collar or any other type of job, their retirement depends upon some type of gains in the markets so that those future earnings and, and what they're going to do in retirement, everyone needs that. Whether you're uh, making 25 grand a year or if you're making two, two million a year, we all depend and rely, even pensioners depend and rely upon the markets over the long haul, not, not on a monthly or daily basis or, or even an annual basis, but over the long haul, we depend on those markets doing well to support our 401ks and our pensions so that we can retire at a decent age and, and have that money last for the rest of our lives. And that I, I don't disagree with John much because I think we think a lot the same. I do agree about you know, why do we have to push all the way down to 2%. But in defense of the Federal Reserve, and continuing to increase rates, even if it damages the markets. The way that they're viewing this is that inflation, overwhelming inflation, will impact everyone. And that's from those that are unemployed, slightly employed, part-time employed, and the affluent, while damaging the job market overall, what what they're really looking at is entry-level and exit-level positions that need to be cut back. And when I talk about entry and exit level, they're really the same type of positions, but it could be those 
part-time or those high school students or college students or those that have retired and they're just trying to to work their way through a, a trip or extra savings or something to do, those entry and exit level positions right now are paying crazy, crazy wages, and it's good for them. You know, we experienced that with with my daughters. You know, both of them work, and they're getting paid way more than I ever thought that they would have when the first one, Abigail, entered the the job place. I never would have thought that while they're still having a, getting an education that they would make this type of money, and it's good from that standpoint, but whatever products or services that those positions are, are uh, producing bring up inflation. It, it makes those products and services more expensive, and that impacts everyone. So from the Federal Reserve, they're saying, hey, both of these are bad, right? We don't necessarily want to damage, we don't want to damage the job market, but if we, we, if we have to, to get inflation down to that target, then that's what we're going to do. And, and that's basically they have said it. We need to see pain in the economy. We need to see softening. They're saying the same thing. We need to see softening in the labor market. And that statement is just the same, a, a different way of saying the same exact thing. And what he's referring to is the employment market, some softening, maybe not the overwhelming unemployment, but enough to bring overall inflation down. But I do agree with you. It's like, man, why does it have to be 2%? Couldn't it be 25 couldn't it be two and three quarters? Couldn't we just live with that? You know, even when we were running out projections for retirement planning, we we don't assume a two percent inflation. We assume it's going to be higher than that, kind of much higher than that. So why in the world does it have to be at two percent? I'm in one hundred percent agreement with you on that. Why does it have to go all the way down to two uh, percent to accomplish that? So Phil, if this were <clears throat> three or four years ago when um, the interest rates were low inflation was flat um wouldn't would a jobs report have caused the markets to go down or is it simply because the markets are running in fear of of the fed raising rates to reduce the inflation that the government caused in the first place uh, this may not be a good example but back again to march and april 2020 when a uh, an unemployment number would come out and the jobs market was extremely, of course, it was extremely unhealthy. They wouldn't let anyone work. Uh, but the reaction was for the Federal Reserve to cut rates, and the markets went up. So that, that, was, that was the main catalyst, that and some of the stimulus that sent our market soaring at a time where we had close to 20% unemployment rates was the actions of the Federal Reserve. And now we're just seeing the reverse of that a little bit slower but we've, we've been seeing the reverse of that since 2020, really in the fourth quarter of 2021, too. But in 2022, everything has funneled into what does it make Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve do, and our markets have reacted in, 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 um, in contradiction to that. So if something good happens, our market has gone down. If something bad happens, our market goes up on the premise that the Federal Reserve would take action to, to offset that whatever, whatever economic event happened. You said something good or something bad. Uh, we have not really spent much time this morning talking about what happened in Israel over last Friday. Uh, we had Ukraine as a model that we've been looking at for the last couple of so years, and the market appears to have absorbed the bad news that coming out of Ukraine. Do you anticipate to be the same case with, uh, with the Middle East? I do, and we'll go back to Ukraine, and that was one of the only good months that we had in 2022 was when Russia invaded Ukraine, and it wasn't because Russia invaded Ukraine. It was because it slowed the Federal Reserve down. They're thinking they were getting ready to do half a percent, and the reason the three-quarters of a percent was such a – such they did it so many times in 2022 was in part because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. They wanted to start earlier – but because of that, they said, man, we can't do half a percent right in the face of this. So they held off. I think they did a quarter of a percent. And our markets rallied because we had priced in half a percent. And then they didn't resume until a little bit later, late spring, early summer. They didn't resume until we kind of settled in on that. And I, I don't know. This is kind of a different narrative with the price of oil. But Jerome Powell has said that they, they focus more on that core uh, inflation readings, which would strip out the price of oil, because there's an easy fix. Oh, I don't want to say it's an easy fix, but with the price of oil, there's there's a fix there where OPEC and OPEC Plus could say we're going to produce more, 
and then that would offset that unrest in, in the oil markets anyway. That would offset that unrest that's going on over there. Now, whether or not they'll do that, I don't know, but they, they kind of hold the cards with that. Phil, before we uh, go, I wanted to share this little nugget with you that was passed along by uh, now former school teacher Julie, who said in fourth grade, my boy had a crush on Phil's daughter, Ada. And <laughs> she, she, she wisely said that Ada said to Julie's son that this won't work because I'm a Steelers fan and you're a Bengals fan. <laughs> That's my girl. That's my girl. I raised them right, didn't I? I raised them right. That's good stuff. My, I would expect my nothing less. Eat at, my oldest wouldn't eat at Burger King for years because I had Redskin cups. <laughs> and I support that type of behavior 100%. I do as well. I 100% support you there. Phil, how do even Ravens fans reach you if they have any financial questions? They don't. You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day. Go Steelers.